Praise the Lord. Are you ready for the word? Praise the Lord. Go ahead and put up our uh, confession here. Let's say this together. One, two, three. This is my Bible, the inspired and living word of God, given to all men for all ages. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. As I'm taught the word of God, I boldly declare that I have eyes to see, I have ears to hear, and that my heart is open and receptive to the truth of God's Word. And I'll not only be a hearer, but I'll be a doer, I'll be a doer, I'll be a doer of the Word of God, and as I do, I know I will be blessed. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Someone give God a shout of praise there. Woo-wee. There's nothing like being a doer of the Word. Amen. And that's exactly what I'm going to talk to you today about, and that is being a doer of the Word. That's not my title, but really, in essence, that's what this whole message is about. So turn to two places for me, if you would, and while you do that, I'm going to read a third. Go to Proverbs chapter 10, and then Ecclesiastes 11, and we began a series a few weeks ago, we're calling, I've sowed my seed, now how do I reap? Anybody interested in learning how, how to be a better harvester, how to reap? Boy, I tell you, I got both hands up, both feet. Uh, I want to learn how to reap like God intended me to reap. How about you? How to harvest. And so we saw in Genesis 8, 22, and this is in the easy to read version, so don't, we don't have that on the screen for it, but just listen. It says, as long as the earth continues, there will always be a time for planting and a time for for harvest. There will always be cold and hot, summer and winter, day and night on the earth. Now in the message it says, for as long as the earth lasts. Is this earth still here? Planting and harvest. Cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will never stop. Now we must understand, just take that off, uh, Jeanette, for just a minute, please. We have to understand one thing about seed time and harvest. And that is that it is a permanent universal, perpetual principle that will never change, that will never be altered until the earth remains no more. Amen? So as long as you wake up in the morning, there's one thing you know, that seed time and harvest is still in effect. Can I hear an amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Now, Jesus taught about this parable of the sower in Mark chapter 4. Anybody read chapter 4 last week? Praise the Lord. Well, he said, this is Jesus' words. He said, if you don't understand this parable of the sower, he says, how will you understand any of the other parables? So that tells me this right here, what we're talking about today, is the granddaddy of them all, of all the, you could say, of the parables. Amen? But in spite of that, I know that there's a lot of people, even pastors, even ministers in big churches, that do not believe in seed time and harvest. And they criticize people like me. They criticize people like you who do believe in seed time and harvest. But you have to wonder, what Bible are they reading? Because, you know, it, it, it doesn't make any sense to me. But here's the thing. Even among people who believe in sowing and reaping, and I classify myself in this category, and I've been, I was there at one time, there have been some assumptions that we have made as faith people that those assumptions need to be addressed and they need to be corrected or they need to be tweaked a little bit, okay? And that assumption, I think for the most part, because I know that I was here, I don't know about you, but all I can tell you is about myself, for many, many years, I thought that if you just sow enough seed and if you just make enough good confessions, then God is simply just going to pour out a blessing after blessing after blessing on you. Anybody have the courage to raise your hand and say, yeah, that was me? I'm, I'm raising right here. But look at Proverbs 10 with me, verse 10 and 4. Jeanette will put that on the screen now for us. 
says he becomes poor that deals with a slack hand, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. The New Century Version says a lazy person will end up poor, but a hard worker will become rich. Hallelujah. Is this scripture right here in Proverbs 10 and 4, is it just as true as John 3.16 or Philippians 4.19 or any other scripture that you want to quote? It is. So he says here, if you are lazy, being lazy will cause a person to be poor. But a hard worker, the, the Bible says, not me, the Bible says a diligent worker will become rich. If you've ever sat in church for a long, long time and wonder why this person is really seems to be prospering and this person just can't seem to get two nickels to rub together every week, it's the same story. Well, maybe this is what's happening. In their life. Maybe that person has just been lazy. Maybe they haven't been diligent the way they should. Diligence is part of seeing the blessing of the Lord in your life. The full measure of the blessing, I should say it that way. But this question needs to be asked, and I'm going to ask it right here. If you are lazy, okay, which I'm believing there's nobody in here, right? Okay. If you are lazy, will you be able to say enough faith confessions to overcome that laziness? I don't think so, because look at number five, or look at verse five, Proverbs 10 and five. He says, he that gathers in summer is what? A wise son. He that sleeps in the harvest is a son that causes shame. Now, I don't know if you've ever really thought about it. Is it possible to sleep through a harvest? Well, apparently it was, or the Bible wouldn't ask us that question. Now, it certainly has happened in the natural. I mean, people, for whatever reason, you know, they haven't sprayed their crops, they haven't fertilized, they haven't watered, they just leave the crop in the field, and the result is the crop just rots. The fruit falls off the vine, whatever it is. Well, if that is true naturally, or stay with me here, if that is true, is that true naturally? Okay. Then it must be true spiritually as well. Because in, we're talking about sowing and reaping. And the simplest way, we said this last week, but let me say it again, the simplest way for us to understand spiritual sowing and reaping is to look at natural sowing and reaping. Why do I say that? Because the natural world is a counterpart or a reflection or a mirror image, you could say, what, of what actually happens in the spiritual realm. So what am I saying? I'm saying the very same principles that govern financial sowing and reaping are the very same principles concerning uh, the sowing of corn or wheat or grain or any other kind of crop. All right, did you find Ecclesiastes? Look at 11 and 4. He says, He that observes the wind shall not sow. He that regards the clouds shall not reap. God's Word translation says, Whoever watches the wind will never plant. Whoever looks at the clouds will never harvest. The easy-to-read version says, you must take a chance. If you wait for perfect weather, you will never plant your seeds. If you're afraid that every cloud will bring rain, you will never harvest your crops. See, you know your harvest needs to come in. You go outside, or you look out the window, and uh-oh, I see some clouds. Guess it looks like it's going to rain. Guess I better not go out there today. It might rain. Well, every day that you look out that window is going to bring some kind of might or could or possibility, right? But he says here the same thing about sowing. Well, we have this coming up in the family this week. This bill's coming due. Uh, the kids need new clothes. The refrigerator, I think it's going to need a compressor. Uh, the car needs new tires. Whatever the thing is, it's just not a good time for me to sow. Okay? Let me ask. <laughs> it's not a good time for me to sow. Guess what time it will be next week? As my dad used to say, it's the same time today it was yesterday at this time. It won't be a good time to sow. What, a, what about next month? It won't be a good time to sow. How about next year? 
Won't be a good time to sow, will it? If you let that stop you, are you listening? The enemy has access to cause something else to happen in your life. Now, I know you don't like to hear that, but it's true. In fact, and I'm telling myself because I've said this. Thank God it hasn't been recently. But many people will actually co cooperate with the devil by saying, well, you know, it's always something. I take one step forward and I get knocked back too. And I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand if you've ever said that. Well, say it again and get more miserable. Go ahead. In the light of spiritual truth, you do not want your mouth to cooperate with the devil. You've just given him access and he is delighted to cooperate with whatever you say. Come on, somebody. And if you let him talk you out of sowing every time you have an opportunity, then you will never reap because there won't be anything there to reap. And unfortunately, there are a lot of folks that are in that sad category today. I'm saying church-wide, not here. But maybe here too. There are a lot of people who've sown. And that's good, but their sowing alone doesn't assure that you're going to reap. Because we've already seen two things, and I'm just kind of reviewing here a minute. We've seen, number one, we've seen that it's possible to sow good seed into good ground, to have a bumper crop, and be lazy and idle and never get in that crop. Amen? Or the other thing we saw is that you can, be, you can start to look at the wrong things, and that'll also keep you from reaping. Well, you know, let me give you an example. There's just, you know, right now in this economic environment and the way that things are in the world, there is no, we've been believing to pay off our house, but the, uh, let's just be real. There is no way that we're going to be able to pay off our house this year, especially the way the economy is. And also, you know, the way things are happening down at the company, I mean, they're talking about laying some folks off and things. So, you know, uh, maybe, we can, maybe we can believe God next year for... Uh, the, the ability to pay our, our house off. Well, if the, you're saying things like that, it sounds reasonable, but you're looking at the clouds and you're believing lies that you can't have that kind of thing happen even this month in October of 2022. Come on, somebody. Let me ask you this. Are there any circumstances that could come up in your life where God would say to you, I can't do it this week. I can't do it this month. I can't do it this year. No. They're only looking at clouds. If you fixate on the clouds and let the circumstances talk you out of expecting, that's exactly what you'll get is nothing. A real man of faith, a real woman of faith will say this, I am not moved by what I see. They're only clouds. I don't care what I hear. I don't care what, what, I, what I read. I don't care what they say. I don't care how it feels. I don't care how it looks. It can happen to me. I said it can happen to me where I live, in my town, in my city, in my house, in my family, for my kids, for my church. I said it can happen. And you can reap. 30-fold, 60-fold, a hundredfold, even more. Come on, somebody. But we have to understand reaping is not automatic, okay? The crop will not just put itself in the barn while you sit back and watch. And I believe this is one of the bigger revelations that many have not gotten yet. But with God's help, we're getting it. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. But I think... What many have seen and thought was correct, again, that if you just sow enough seed, well, how much is enough? How do you know when you've sowed enough seed? If you just sow enough seed, just make enough good confessions, then God is just going to bring in the harvest while you sit back and watch. And I'm telling you right now, I thought that for many, many years and never saw the kind of harvest I thought I should see. And I'm going, why is this not working? Now I understand why. And I don't mean this disparagingly, but just look around the room. 
to see that this is, this is not the case for most people, that they're not reaping the way they should be reaping. Many of you have sown seed. Many of you have made lots of confessions, and yet there's, you're not where you need to be. And I'm not saying that to be critical. I'm saying that to encourage you, to let you know there is more. God's word is true. God wants you to come up, and we are going to experience those kind of harvests in our lives. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Many, many people in the church are not experiencing 30, 60, 100 fold. Many aren't even experiencing tenfold. How about twofold? How about 1.5 fold? Come on, reaping is not automatic. And if you've not been with us previously, uh, you need to go to our website. Uh, get caught up because we've covered a lot of ground to this point. But last week, how many were here last week? Praise the Lord. We got into tithing as it results, or I should say as it relates to harvest. And I know in my heart that we're not finished with that yet. So that's what we're going to talk about again. So here's the question that needs to be asked, okay? This, here's the elephant in the room. Are you ready? Ha, here's the question. Has tithing changed? Has it been done away with? Is tithing legalism? Are you sure? Now, if you will think back a few weeks, there was a very, very prominent pastor. And I'm not saying this to criticize him or disparage him in any way. He's a, one that we've sat under personally for many, many times, gleaned a lot of revelation over the years, loved the man dearly. He has huge churches. He came out with this revelation that rocked the Christian world, that tithing has changed. And at that time, it really irritated me. And I wanted, the, the next Sunday, I said, man, should I just toss everything aside and get into this thing? So the Lord said, no, just continue where you are. I'll tell you when the time is, is right. Well, today, the time is right. Okay, and I'm glad that I didn't just, uh, you know, speak out of emotions and speak out, you know, because it really, it riled me up. Hallelujah. But how many know we can't agree to disagree on some things? Amen? So uh, I'm going to give you the Word of God as best I know it today, and you have to make that decision in your heart. But again, has tithing changed? Has it been done away with? Is it legalism? Or any other kind of excuse maybe that you've heard people say to use as a reason that they don't tithe? Now, I would not be doing you a favor if I did not make this statement as we begin. Listen closely. I am not talking about tithing to this church or any other church. Did you hear what I just said? I'm talking to you about tithing to God. Big difference, okay? And so what I would ask you today, because everybody here comes from different places, different backgrounds, different teachings, whatever it is, I ask you just be honest with your own heart. Openly study this thing out, scripturally. And don't make it about the money this morning. Did you hear that? Don't make it about the money. Make it about what you see in the Word, what your heart believes, and after we're done today, if you still don't believe that tithing is something that you should be doing, we're not going to argue with you. We're not going to de degrade you or come down on you. But I can tell you one thing. JoJo and I are tithers. This church is a tithing church. Amen? This is covenant for us. And once you understand true covenant, you will never, ever again have to ask the question, well, do we have to? Do we have to tithe? No, you do not have to. Write that down. You do not have to tithe. But what I would say is you desperately need to. Did you catch that one? Because if you're not, the devil is eating your lunch. Ask me how I know. Your finances need two things. They need blessing, and they need protection. And it does not matter how much money you give, 
how many confessions you make, you will not have it if you do not tithe. Now, I know that won't be popular with a lot of people, but I stand by that statement. But here's the thing. Don't take my word for it. Go over these scriptures that we're about to look at. Be totally honest with your own heart. And again, don't make it about the money, all right? But again, if, if you go home and you pray about it and you look at it and you are convinced that you are not to the, then by all means, do not tithe. Be true to your own heart. But let's say this together right now. Say this with me. Mean it with all your heart. Lord, if this is right and you want me to do this, I will receive it from you. I'm willing and I'm open to do it in Jesus' name. All right. Praise the Lord. All right. What I'm talking about today, Pastor Jojo and I believe with all our hearts, we just don't say it, we do it. We do it in our lives, we do it in this church. And if you heard, how many were here for the testimony at the end that my wife shared? Hallelujah. This is what got us out of never having enough, of always being behind, of not being able to, be, get, to get caught up, of not being able to give into the projects that we wanted to give into. And we were, you know, we'd been in the church for a long, long time. I'd been a pastor. This is what changed our life, and I'm telling you, it can do the same for you. Amen? Now, let me just give you a quick example. Over the last two years, with this pandemic that was forged upon us, there have been churches all over the country, hundreds and thousands, that have had to close their doors. Churches with scores of more people than we have here. Churches with scores more money than we have here. But we're still here. We're still here. I said, we're still here. And we give all the glory to God. And I believe a major reason that we're still here. We have been, we are, and we always be a tithing church. I've had people, Pastor Chris, how can you afford that expensive mall rental with the number of people you have in your congregation? All I can say is, but God. God has sustained us. Amen? All right, so with that said, go with me again to Malachi chapter 3. Again, just stay open. Need my water here. Open your heart, open your mind, don't be in... Don't be guided by maybe what you've heard in the past. Just be totally open and make a decision based on the truth that, and the witness to your heart and to your spirit. In Malachi 3 and verse 8, he says, Will a man rob or defraud God? Who, who's speaking right here? This is amazing, folks. God himself is talking to us and asking us a question, will a man rob or defraud God? You're going, oh my goodness, how can we rob or defraud God? He says, yet you rob and defraud me. And we say, well, how do we rob and defraud you, Lord? You have withheld your tithes and your offerings. You are, because of that, you're cursed with the curse. You are robbing me, even this whole nation. Now, let's stop right here for just a second. As I was meditating on this last night and this morning, just think. Well, let me, let me back up. Let me say this. Most people in churches do not tithe. How do you know that? I just know in my heart they don't. If every Christian tithed in this country, do you know what this country would look like? We wouldn't need to have government feeding programs and welfare and all the things that they spend billions of dollars on. The church would be able to more than finance it, at, not at a debt, but with cash. We'd be able to feed every hungry person. We'd be able to house every homeless person. And it would be to the glory of God. That's why he says, you're robbing me, even this whole nation. This nation has been robbed 
because of the people in the churches that are not tithing. This is just as true today as it was when it was written how many, who many, how many thousands of years ago. So God says, so, verse 10, bring all the tithes. Tithe means the tenth, or the ten percent. The whole tenth of your income, where? Into the storehouse, that there be, be, may be food in my house, and prove me now by it, says the Lord. I don't know of any other place in the Bible that God himself speaks to us and says, I want you to prove it to, uh, test me. In any other context, we know that if we say, well, God, I'm going to make you prove that you're a healer. Well, it, that would be judged as, as tempting the Lord. Even, you know, when Satan said, well, you know, Jesus, just throw yourself down from the pinnacle because, you know, God's word says, you know, his angels will take charge of you to lift you up lest you dash your foot against the stone. And he says, thou shalt not tempt the Lord your God. So this here almost sounds like we're tempting God, but God himself says, go ahead and test me in this very thing. Wow. He says, if what? Test me and prove, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Do we have to tithe? No, you don't. Neither do you have to have open windows of heaven pouring out blessings on your life that you won't have room enough to receive it. But that's not all. He doesn't even stop there. Look at verse 11. And he goes, and I will rebuke, I personally, I Jehovah Jireh, I, God Almighty, I will rebuke the seed eater. I will rebuke the very person who is out to eat your seed for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine drop its fruit before the time in the field, says the Lord of hosts. Oh, my word. Ooh, I received that too. Now, in the natural, if you're a farmer, and they, we've made obviously lots of advances since this time, you know, but it still can be very, very costly, you know, to get all the, the, the chemicals and the fertilizers, you know, to spray your crops and do all the things to make sure that, that the pests don't devour it. But spiritually, one of the biggest benefits that you can receive as, because you are a tither is having the devourer rebuked off of your stuff. Hallelujah. I'm telling you this morning, folks, as your pastor, as your friend, the enemy is waiting with bated breath for an opportunity to eat and consume and destroy and devour your seed and your harvest because he knows it's your lifeline and he hates your guts and he wants to destroy you. And God said, he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall the vine drop its fruit before its time in the field, says who? The Lord of hosts. The Lord of God's heavenly armies. The head of God, the armies himself. God himself. Folks, this is blessed and this is protected. These are the benefits of being a tither. Can I hear an amen? I'm telling you, if you haven't figured this out yet, the Lord has the ability to protect you from that which devours and that which destroys. If that weren't true, then why do we have Psalm 91? Hmm? He even has the ability to protect your stuff from premature wear or decay. And we read about it last week in Leviticus 26. In other words, you still have so much of your first harvest left that when the next harvest comes in, you have to make room for the new by sowing the old because you don't have room for the new. That's blessed and protected, folks. How could the entire nation of Israel for 40 years 
walk around the desert. You know, there, I mean stones and sand and dirt, and, you know, all the stuff, and have their sandals not wear out. Anybody here had a pair of sandals last you 40 years? And you're walking on carpet. God has that ability. He has the ability to cause your refrigerator to run and 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 to run. Things the world calls normal wear and tear. Listen to this. The things the world calls normal wear and tear is actually the enemy devouring your stuff. We have this deep box freezer. You know what a box freezer is? We used to call it a coffin freezer. You know, it's a big box. It's about six feet long and maybe four feet wide, and you open the thing and you look in it. You know, I guess if you died, you could lay yourself in there. We bought that thing used. I mean, re this thing was old. Oh, is that what it was? Okay. So how many years did you have it? I mean, but the thing was old. It was not, she did not buy it new, I can tell you right now. Okay, so she even knows who she bought it from. 20 years later now, that thing is running and running and running and running and running. How in the world does that work? What? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And if something does, you know, come, God can replace it for a fraction of the cost. We were on vacation, and I don't think that we probably prayed or put the blood of Jesus over our house like we probably should have. But we had a huge lightning storm, took out our well, took out our pump, took out our double ovens in our kitchen. And so, you know, if you've ever been with Pastor Jojo on the weekends to garage sales, I don't usually go, but I go, I'm going along with her, and she's driving, and I'm in the thing, and I look over, and hey, stop, stop, stop! There's there's a double up, stand, double oven standing on the sidewalk. I go, look, look, there's a double oven right there. I went over, it is brand new. They just moved into the house. The wife didn't like the color, so they took it out and bought a whole new set and put the color in she liked. And I said, uh, is this for sale? And he goes, yeah. I said, how much is Oh, I don't know, $100. $100 for a double oven. You're talking two, $3,000. Hallelujah. We're tithers. And that freezer, it has been running for 20 years. It just keeps running and running and running and running. I, I put two elk in that thing. That is not supposed to be in the world. Amen? But God. I said, but God. Hallelujah. So if you find things in your life that are beginning to wear out, or even what we call prematurely, then you need to find out why. Amen? Why? Because those things eat up your profit. It eats up your extra money. Things that you could be spending that money on something else. Amen? But I'm telling you, if you're not doing this, then you don't have to, if you're not a tither, you don't have to look any farther than right here to understand why. Amen? Now, last week we talked about the importance of having good seed, of sowing that good seed into good ground, but we said that's not enough, right? Because you can put the best seed that you can get into the best ground you can find, and you can have, but if you do not have adequate sunshine and good rain, uh, you know, mild weather, you can lose the whole crop. Well, that's what the blessing of the Lord is all about. That's the Lord's part. The rain from heaven, the sunshine from heaven. You put it in the ground. The ground does what it does the way God designed it. That's God's part. Amen? That's the blessing of the Lord. And that's the first part of the blessing of tithing. And then God says, test me and prove me. If I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour you out a blessing. But you have to understand, even with good sunshine, adequate rain, mild weather, your crop is ready to produce 60, 30, 100 fold, whatever. In the blink of an eye, you could have a swarm of locusts come in 
and within an hour have that entire crop completely destroyed. Just ask a farmer. But thank God he said, I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. And that devourer shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine drop its fruit before the time in the field, says the Lord of hosts. What gets you protection from the devourer? Being a tither. You see, you need protection just as much as you need the blessing. What gets you that? Tithing. Tithing is not sowing, but if you want your sowing blessed, you need to be a tither. Okay? So let's look at some of the issues that people have with tithing. Uh, go with me to Luke, or no, I'm sorry, Leviticus 27. Twenty-seven and thirty, he says, "All the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord." One of the definitions of holy is to be separated. Is there a part? Okay, is there a part that belongs to the Lord and is holy? and separated to him? It's not a trick question. Does the, the tithe, or what we would say today, the 10%, ten, the ten or the 10, does the tithe belong to the Lord? Not 50%, not 80%, not even 15%, not 10.5%, 10%. I've heard people say, well, Pastor Chris, I'm tithing 15%. No, you're not. You can only tithe 10%. The other five would be an offering. Well, Pastor, I'm tithing 8%. No, you're not tithing. The tithe, by definition, is what? 10%. Does this have anything to do with being able to harvest? The Lord said, that if we tithe and even prove him in this thing, that he would bless us and he would protect us. Do you see why we're talking about this today? This is what Pastor Jojo and I believe. And not only do we believe, but we've been doing this now for decades. This is what this church does as well. Look at another scripture with me. Deuteronomy chapter 14. Deuteronomy 14 and 22. He says, you shall surely tithe all the yield of your seed produced by your field each year. Now, there are numerous other scriptures that you can find in the Old Testament that say essentially this same thing. But one of the best is in the New Testament, something that Jesus himself said. Go to Matthew 22. The people come to Jesus one day. They're trying to tempt him. They're trying to trap him. They're trying to get him to say or do something that the government is not going to like to get him arrested, say something that's unlawful. So they, they ask him a question. They say, Jesus, is it lawful for us to pay taxes to Caesar? Again, they're trying to trap him. So Jesus asks them a question, and he says this. He says, well, tell me, uh, what, whose picture is on that coin that they have? And they said, and this is verse 21, they said, Caesar's. He says, awesome. I'm just paraphrasing here. So he says to them, pay therefore to Caesar the things that are due to Caesar. And what? Pay to who? Pay to who? To God the things that are due to God. Is Jesus talking about money right here? Well, then there's something that we're supposed to be paying to God. Would you agree with that? Let me give you an example in the, in the real world. You can all relate to this. If the IRS tells you, this part is ours, do I have your attention? Does it make any difference what you think, whether it's right or not? Well, I just don't believe in taxes. 
Well, honey, that's wonderful. But if you don't pay us, we're going to put you in jail. We're going to confiscate your belongings. We'll, we'll put a, a, what's the thing on your wages? We'll garnish your wages until we get what you owe us. But yet people do the same thing all the time concerning what belongs to God, and I'm talking about the tithe. I just don't believe in tithing. Well, it's easy to do that because, first of all, God won't sue you. God won't put you in jail. He won't garnish your wages. That's a good thing. Amen? But he also cannot bless you, and he also cannot protect you, because if he did, he would go against his own word. And he honors his word above his name. Blessing and protection come with the tithe as a benefit. How many like benefits? So try this. This is what people do to God all the time, but try this with the IRS. Well, I worked hard for that money, and that money is my money. And no one is going to tell me what I do with my money. Am I, am I hitting it where we live here right now? But yet that's the same argument people use to justify not tithing to God. Do you see this? I'm telling you, you best give your money to the IRS, the amount that they say is theirs, not only because it's the law of the land, but the, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ told you to give it to them. Did he not? Now, don't choke over this. I've had some, you know, over the years, we've had some big tax bills. God said, stop choking over it. Just believe me for some extra income. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. And I also, when I, when I have to pay those taxes, I look at it as sowing seed into my country. Well, you, well Pastor Chris, they just waste so much of your money. Not my, they don't waste my taxes. My taxes go to, 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 to support our, our troops. They go to build our roads. They go to build our schools. They go for good things. My taxes do. That's my declaration. How about you? They're not wasting my, my taxes. And, there's, and, and I'm getting, a, that's a seed. And I'm believing for a harvest out of that. See, if you're obeying God, then he can take care of whatever, whatever it takes in your life, including your taxes. But as surely as there's money that belongs to the government, there is a portion that belongs to God. Did we not just read that? He said the tenth or the tithe, the ten percent is holy to the Lord and it's his. So you have to decide this morning on whether that ten percent belongs to you or does it belong to God. And here's the thing. If the tithe actually belongs to God, if that 10% is actually God's money, are you listening? Then you cannot decide what to do with it or what to spend it on. It does not belong to you in the first place. It's His. Look at your neighbor and say, it's His. Can I give you an example? Let's say I have money that belongs to you. Connie, I have $2,000 that belongs to you. So I can't, well, I think I'm going to take that money and I'm going to go over here and spend it on this. I think I'll take that and go buy some accessories for my boat. Would you be okay with that? What? How, how close-minded is she? I mean, you, you wouldn't mind me using your money to buy stuff for my boat, right? No, it's not my money. It's her money. It's not your money. It's God's money. Are you okay with me taking money and buying boat accessories with it, if it belongs to you? So actually, folks, here's where the rubber meets it. If you believe the Scriptures... This is where you have to be honest with your own heart now. And I said, don't make it about the money. 
Because it's not about fooling me or fooling your neighbor or fooling your spouse. This is something that's between you and God alone. If you take the tithe and you do anything else with it besides give it to God, he says in his words, I didn't write this, you are robbing me. Will a man rob or defraud God? Yet you rob me and defraud me. Say this after me. The tithe belongs to the Lord. The tithe belongs to the Lord. Hallelujah. Why would God say this? Does he need your money? No. No. It's because God wants in your business. God wants in your life. God wants in your occupation. He wants in your finances. He desperately wants to bless you. Let's look at another one, Matthew 23. Is Matthew in the Old Testament or in the New Testament? New Testament. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you pretenders, you hypocrites, for you give a tenth of your mint and dill and cumin. In other words, it's like tithing your salt and pepper. I mean, they're getting down to the nitty-gritty details. You give a tenth or a tithe of your mint and dill and cumin, and you've neglected and awaited the weightier and more important matters of the law, right and justice and mercy and fidelity. These you ought particularly to have done without neglecting the others. Is this the New Testament? These you ought particularly to have done. What does that mean? Is Jesus saying right here that you should have tithed? Listen to it in the New Living Translation. What sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, hypocrites, For you're careful to tithe even the tiniest income from your herb gardens, but you ignore the more important aspects of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. You should tithe, yes, but do not neglect the more important things. Did Jesus just say, yes, you should tithe? I didn't write this. Does this carry any weight with you? It should because these are red letters. There is a holy part. There is a portion that belongs to the Lord. People say, well, you know, it's after, that, was be, that was during the law. Tithing was with Abraham, and Abraham was thousands of years before the law. He was before the Ten Commandments. He was before Moses. He was before the Mosaic Law ever came into being. And then tithing existed with the law when it came in. And now we see that Jesus himself said, it is also after the law. So the argument that tithing is just legalism does not hold water in any shape, form, or fashion. If you say, well, tithing has changed in the New Testament, Pastor Chris, my question to you is, why has it changed? Where has it changed? When was it changed? If, he, if Jesus was going to change it, this, don't you think this would have been a perfect timing to say, well, I just want you to know, folks, tithing has changed now. This is the way we're going to do it. He didn't say that. He said, yes, you should tithe. Let me ask you this. Let me, let me because people say, well, Pastor, it's all Old Testament. We, if you weren't here a couple weeks ago, I showed you a a $50 bill and I showed you a $100 bill. And I said, which one is more valuable? Remember? What did you say? The 100. Why is the 100 more valuable than the 50? Because the 100 has the 50 in it. In the New Testament, in the dispensation of grace, everything, the new, the the dispensation of grace has everything in it that was in the Old Testament plus what we have now. Hallelujah. Do we still pray? Well, why do you pray? It's Old Testament. 
Do you still repent? That's Old Testament. Hmm. Now, either one is right or the other, so you need to be consistent here. Do we still have faith in God? That's Old Testament. Do we still obey God? Old Testament. <laughs> Do you still believe that you're not supposed to commit adultery? Old Testament. Do you, do you still believe that you're not supposed to lie? You're not supposed to steal? Old Testament. See where I'm going? Why, why are those still in effect? Because all of those are truths. They're not the truth. They're all truths. Amen? Huge portions of today's church do not tithe. And it's sad in my retrospect, because they're forfeiting this blessing and they're forfeiting the protection and the opportunity to honor God with what belongs to Him. And it's actually, as we saw earlier, it's a detriment to our nation. I've never seen it in that form before until this week. And they think they know why they don't tithe, but a lot of times it's just ignorance. Sometimes it's plain just dishonesty, and sometimes it's just plain greed. I'm just telling, it, telling you right out front. But with all that aside, okay, it's not what I believe. It's not what Pastor Jojo believes. Are you being honest with yourself today and what you see in this word? Don't let it be about the money. Be honest. Be sincere. And be truthful with your own heart. Okay. Well, so for time's sake, I'm not going to read it to you, but you can go to Genesis, and it would take us probably another 15 or 20 minutes, but read about Abraham and his defeat of the kings and the rescue of his uh, nephew Lot. And you all know the story that after it was over, uh, he was met by Melchizedek, who was called the priest of the Most High God. And it says that after all that was finished, it says that Abraham gave tithes of all. How many remember the story? I thought about this for a number of years, and I never really got some revelation until just this week or last week. How and why did Abraham tithe? He didn't have a Bible. The Old Testament wasn't written. The New Testament, of course, wasn't written. It's centuries before the law. How did Abraham know he needed to tithe? Well, I believe it was by revelation from God himself. And he took that revelation and he put his faith with it and he tithed 10%. After all, he's called the father of what? The father of faith, is he not? Look at Galatians 3.6. We'll put it up on the screen for you even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, that's us, amen? The same are the children of Abraham, and the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all the nations be blessed. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. My point is this, what Abraham did, and the scriptures tell us that he was made righteous because of the faith, we do the same thing today. Our tithing preempts the law, but our tithing also goes past the law. Are you with me? The way Abraham lived is supposed to be the way you and I live today. Amen? Do you see this? He didn't do this by law. He did, he did it by faith. He tithed 10% by faith. He said, God, if you're able to do this, then I will surely give you the 10th. Hallelujah. And so we know, if you read the story, how God blessed him. God protected him. How could a man with like 118 servants that he trained himself defeat the armies Trained armies of 
five kings, not one nation, but five nations, five kings with 118 people. That's a miracle. God protected him. And he poured out so much blessing in Abraham's life. At one point he said, there's not enough room in the land for us to all to, to graze our stock. That's how many animals he had. So God is saying today, see if I will not open to you the windows of heaven and pour you out such a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Not enough room. Hallelujah. I like that phrase. Not enough room. Hallelujah. I thought this was really interesting. I heard Brother Keith say just recently, he said that more and more couples who are getting married in his church are actually putting tithing, uh, tithing in their marriage vows. Isn't that amazing? I mean, you want to help increase your odds of a young, newly married couple being successful? Well, I'm telling you, one of the major disconnects for, for young marrieds today is finances. I mean, you get married, most people don't have a home. They, you know, they, they need everything, right? You have, you have a lot of things you need, most everything you need. Well, this is where it starts, right here. A commitment to honor God with the tithe. Because when you do, he says he's going to bless your finances and he's going to protect them. And that's the way you come up. Do we have to tithe? What's the answer? No. Do you have to pray? No. Do you have to go to church? No. Do you have to obey? Do you have to walk in love? No. You're supposed to, but you don't have to. You can do whatever it is you decide to you and your little heart, your little puny, your little puny little mind. But if you're smart, I said, if you're smart. Are there any smart people in here today? Yeah. If you're smart, praise the Lord, you'll choose to believe just how big God really is. And you'll put Him to the test. Amen? So let's look at, let's close with looking at Malachi 3 one more time. He says, bring all the tithes. In other words, the 10%. The whole tenth of your income into the storehouse. Why? So that there may be, be food in my house and prove me now by it, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour you out a blessing, what kind of blessing? That there shall not be room enough to receive it. But he doesn't stop there. He could have. But he says in verse 11, I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine drop its fruit before the time in the field, says the Lord of hosts. This word windows, amazing word. It's the same word that was used in Genesis in connection with the floodwaters coming on the earth. God opened a window, and the result was that the waters above the earth flooded just came in and flooded the entire earth. What happens when you open a window at home? You open that window at home, it allows whatever is on the outside to come in, does it not? So before the window was opened, uh, whatever is on the it couldn't get into your house, is that correct? Here's the question. Does the Lord need an opening? To get, into your, to get into your life so that he can get into your finances. Yeah. Well, what's connected to those openings? Tithing. It's an act of faith. It's an act of honor. It's an act of obedience. And God calls it an opening. He calls it a window into your life. And through that opening, God says, I am going to pour you out blessings after blessing after blessing and so much you won't have room enough to receive it. Amen. Now God is able to get it from heaven into your life. But if you will not open that window, then God does not have access 
and he never will without your permission. Why? Because there's no opening. There's no window to get those things to you. How do you give him permission to come in? Tithing. Do you see why this has been so mixed up, so scrambled by the enemy himself? Because he doesn't want you to increase. But you're the only one that can open that window. You're the only one that can open that door, open that window. Do you want or do you need God in your finances, in your material things? Do you need him there? Absolutely. Tithing is the answer that, let God's in, that lets God in. Amen? And it takes faith to do it. I said it takes faith. Amen. I've heard people say this. Well, Pastor Chris, I just don't have enough money to do that. That is not true. It never will be true. The truth of the matter is, you don't have enough faith to do it. If you keep the tithe, are you listening? If you keep the tithe, I can assure you, you will not keep it. What do I mean by that? I'm meaning if you keep the tithe, the devourer will come in and consume the money you kept, and he'll devour all the rest of your money as well. Ask me how I know. Do not be deceived. Keeping God's money will not help you in any form or fashion. It forfeits the blessing and it forfeits the protection. 90% blessed. 90% protected. I would rather have that any day than 100% cursed. How about you? So what I want you to do here, I want you to listen real carefully. I want you to close your eyes first of all. Those that are preparing things, please do the same. I appreciate your, your, your serving. Let's just take a few minutes. We'll be fine. Close your eyes, lift your hands to the Lord. And I want you to say this after me, but let me, let me say this first. If you don't mean what I'm about to say, then I don't want you to say this. Are you with me? But say this, Father God, I believe in you with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, and all my strength. I believe that you are real and that you are good. And I acknowledge that I would not exist if it were not for you. You gave me life and you sustain that life. Every moment of the day, I would have nothing. I would have nothing. I would have nothing except you opened your hand and allowed me to have it allowed me to do it, enabled me and gave me the strength, gave me the favor, gave me the ideas, gave me the understanding, gave me the wisdom and opportunity to get it, to do it, and to have it. I acknowledge that you are my God, and I am completely dependent on you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Now, just before we leave, I am going to reaffirm my commitment to tithing. I'm going to ask my wife to come up, stand next to me here. But here's the thing, and no one's going to criticize or judge you. If you don't believe this, what I just talked about, if you're not convinced yet, then don't do this. Okay? But if you're sure, if you're convinced, then I want you to do it. Amen? But if you're not, you need to get this settled in your heart once and for all. Go home, pray about it, study the scriptures, get your thesaurus out, go back and forth, look up the deep meanings of the words, whatever you need to do. But get it settled in your heart once and for all. But I'm telling you, let the word of God dwell richly in your heart. 
And don't make it about the money. But if you are convinced, I want you to stand up. Please, everybody, just stand. Say this with me. Father God, I say like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, you are my God. I am with you forever. You will never leave me nor forsake me. And I will not leave you by your grace. I will not forsake you. I will stay with you. And you will be my God. And I will be your child. And as you help me, and as you give me food to eat, and clothes to wear, and a place to live, and everything I need, and all the good things to enjoy, I will certainly give the tithe to you. I will certainly return the holy portion to you, my God. And you told me that if I will do this, you will open the windows of heaven. You will make openings to get things from heaven into the earth. And you will pour out blessings on me that I don't have room enough to receive it. And you will rebuke the devourer for my sake. And I will be blessed. And I will be called delightsome and the blessed of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Now give him a shout of praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is a good God. Amen. Hallelujah. Here's just a little tidbit. This just absolutely just tickled me pink, I guess is the word to say. So I'm studying this, and I look up the word windows in Hebrew. Do you know what the transliteration for the word windows is in the Hebrew? Are you ready? Aruba. I am not kidding you. Look it up. Aruba. We love you, God loves you, and Jesus is Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. I've got the victory.